اللهم صل على محمد طب القلوب ودوائها وعافية الأجسال وشفائها ونور الأبصار وجلائها وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم بخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعض فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونزلنا عليك الكتابة بيانا لكل شيء وهدى ورحمة وبشرى للمسلمين صدق الله العظيم Brothers and sisters, sons and daughters here at the International Islamic University in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as He ought to be praised. <coughs> and we pray this night for his guidance and for his protection for his mercy for his forgiveness for his love and we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all the Blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam who more than 1400 years ago in the desert of Arabia <coughs> prophesied that Muslims will one day conquer the city of Constantinople and who praised that army and who praised its commander, its Amir. Tonight we will attempt to simply introduce the subject for it cannot be comprehensively dealt with in one lecture. <coughs> Tonight, inshallah, all that we will do is to introduce the basic subject. For we cannot deal with this subject comprehensively in one lecture. So if there are parts of the subject which are not mentioned, that's your homework. That's your homework. Indeed, there are parts of the subject which are beyond my expertise. For example, the military implications of the conquest of Constantinople. You need someone with expertise in military science. Hmm? So we will be attempting to build the basic foundation of the subject. We hope and pray, inshallah, that Allah may make it possible for us to write an essay which will be more comprehensive than this lecture. And we want to begin by directing attention to something very strange and very mysterious which occurred about a hundred years ago almost a hundred years ago when Mustafa Kamal 
and his, they call themselves the Young Turks, <coughs> were able to seize control of the city of Constantinople from its previous Ottoman rulers and then send the Sultan Khalifa packing. I believe he was sent to Switzerland. When the new administration took control of the country and of the city, they eventually proclaimed it the Republic of Turkey, the secular Republic of Turkey. But that's not all that they did. They decided, mysteriously so, to move the capital from Constantinople to a place called, at that time it was called Angora. Now it's known as Ankara. And not only did they shift the capital out of Constantinople, but they also changed the name of the city <coughs> to one of the several other names. You know, New York is also known as the Big Apple. <laughs> so cities have several names, but New York is the official name. So too, Constantinople was the official name. And there were several other names. So they chose one of the several other, the Big Apple. And they gave to the name, the city, they renamed the city Istanbul. But that's not all. Mustafa Kemal did something more. Something which has to be recognized as monstrously wicked. He prohibited, prohibited the use of the name Constantinople. The law is you're not allowed to use the name Constantinople. That's the law. You violate the law, you pay the price for it. Why did he do that? My answer is that if you are a Muslim, then Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam is your leader. And if my leader referred to the city by the name Constantinople, as he did on several occasions, then no Muslim can be part and parcel to changing the name from Constantinople. No. It's an act of disrespect to the Prophet ﷺ. The enemies may change a name as much as they want, but we Muslims will stay with the name used by the Prophet ﷺ. And if you prohibit us from using that name, you are wicked. You are committing a monstrous act of zulm. That's how we start the lecture tonight. I, because I follow Muhammad for the rest of lec this lecture, I am not going to use the name chosen by Mustafa Kamal. For the rest of this lecture, I'm going to use the name that Muhammad used when he said, لَتَفْتَحَنَّ الْكُنْسْتَنْتِنِيَةِ you will most certainly conquer Constantinople. <coughs> Why did they change the name? I would like to suggest to you that the answer to that question is located in Ilm Akhiru Zaman. That when you study Ilm Akhiru Zaman or Islamic eschatology, you will quickly realize that the conquest of Constantinople prophesied, prophesied by Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, has not as yet.
taken place. And we will prove that tonight, inshallah. That conquest of Constantinople is still to come. But it was part and parcel of the strategy of those who took over from the Ottoman Empire to conceal what is to come, to throw dust in our eyes so that we would forget the subject. We would be lazy in our study of the subject and we would uncritically assume in ignorance assume as so many scholars of Islam have assumed and it's there in black and white on the internet they can't erase it now that they concluded that the conquest of Constantinople by the Ottomans in 1453 fulfilled the prophecy that's the mountain of a mistake which they made and they will live to regret that mistake and so they changed the name of the city in order to obscure the subject they prohibited the use of the name uh, Constantinople in order to obscure the subject that we would forget about it but when the conquest of Constantinople does take place and from tonight from tonight we hope that the subject is going to come back to center stage in the attention of the world because we now have the internet we have YouTube to reach all over the world that when even non-Muslims learn that the Prophet of Islam has prophesied that that city of Constantinople is going to be conquered in the future and as events move in that direction the implication would be that Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam will be returning to center stage in the world because no one else not a single voice in the whole world the history of the world none have ever said that None has ever said that Muslims are going to conquer Constantinople in Akhir zaman This is going to cause NATO to have difficulty in digesting their food. This is going to cause Washington and London and Jerusalem and the so-called Islamic government in Turkey to have difficulty in digesting their food because Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam is now returning to center stage in the world after they have spent all this time and effort waging war on Islam demonizing Muslims demonizing Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam all of that is now going to be pushed aside as Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam returns to center stage and the Turkish government is exposed what is the methodology that we will adopt in dealing with this subject of the conquest of Constantinople <coughs> in Akhiru Zaman there are some verses of the Quran which are plain and clear they're called Muhkamat but Allah also sent other verses of the Quran which are not plain and clear and which have to be interpreted and these are called the Mutashabihat so too with a hadith sometimes 
a hadith is plain and clear Mukhkar. a city is going to be conquered and the name of the city is given Constantinople but sometimes the hadith is not plain and clear for example that a Khalifa would die and there would be disagreement concerning succession everybody of course already know who, what that applies to a Khalifa would die and there will be disagreement concerning succession and while those disagreements are being played out a man will emerge out of Medina and hurry to Makkah and in Makkah he'll be proclaimed as Imam al-Mahdi who is that Khalifa? there is room for interpretation here Hizb al-Tahrir came to a conclusion which I fear they're going to regret eventually, not long from now that because a Khalifa is going to die the implication is that Khilafa will be restored before Imam al-Mahdi because the word Khalifa is used and so Hizb al-Tahrir has built the foundation of the struggle on this that it is possible for Khilafah to be restored before the advent of Imam al-Mahdi <laughs> and our view is no the word Khalifa here does not stand for the restoration of Khilafah it, it refers to any ruler and in this particular case we have said for many years now he's going to be a Saudi king a Saudi king is going to die and then you're going to see all the fighting, infighting amongst all the princes which has already started so you have a hadith which are plain and clear and others which are not so and subject to interpretation but of course when you interpret you must always say Allah knows best this is not the case with Constantinople there are several hadith in which Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam refers to the city by name when declaring that it will be conquered our methodology is to stay with those ahadiths in which the city is mentioned by name or the city can easily be identified as Constantinople there is no room for different interpretations <coughs> and if and now listen carefully particularly those who are going to be listening to this lecture on the internet if there are a hadith which refer to a city but it is plain as daylight that it is not clear it is subject to interpretation and some people assume that that city is Constantinople while others say no it's a city in Syria etc then we ask the question where is the Sunnah of literary consistency why should Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam on the same subject be plain and clear in identifying the city and yet in other so-called alleged ahadith uh, sorry in other ahadith it is alleged that he is referring to Constantinople we say no proper methodology is that you stay with the ahadith which plainly identifies the city as Constantinople in order to maintain the Sunnah of literary consistency and so my methodology is to stay only with these ahadiths when we do that it will be possible for us inshallah 
before the Azan to demonstrate that the conquest of Constantinople, the prophecy, will be fulfilled in Akhiru Zaman. And as a consequence, to further conclude that the conquest of Constantinople in 1453 does not fulfill the prophecy. <coughs> when we adopt this methodology and we establish that the conquest of Constantinople is to come, we now have homework to do. And I'm explaining this because we got students here who are serious students and you would want to go to work on this subject and now that I'm bringing it to your attention probably for the first time and that is that my teacher of blessed memory Maulana Dr. Fadlur Rahman Ansari Rahimahullah taught do not take any verse of the Quran in isolation to study it. If you do that, then you'll come to the conclusion that Iblis was an angel. Oh yes. Rather, you must go to the totality of the data and bring all the verses together to bring them together as a harmonious whole and find out that which binds them together, he calls it the system of meaning. Similarly, uh, only then will you get the correct meaning of the verse. Similarly, do not ever make the mistake of taking any hadith by itself in isolation and studying it, because you could land yourself in embarrassing mistakes. That's lazy scholarship. Rather, you must go to all the data pertaining to the subject. And so what we have to do is go to the totality of Islamic eschatology, or Ilmu Akhiru Zaman, a subject with which I have been engaged in studying for I don't know how many long years now. If you want to study Islamic eschatology, I suggest to you this book will be helpful. Jerusalem in the Quran, written 10 years ago, and we now have it in Bahasa as well. When you have studied Islamic eschatology, you are comfortable with that subject, or Ilmu Akhiru Zaman, only then, only then are you going to take up the Ahadith on the conquest of Constantinople. Not before, not before. Because then you'll be able to see the linkages that this has to the bigger picture. <coughs> Did the conquest of Constantinople in 1453 have anything to do with Akhiru Zaman? The whole world has accepted this is the fulfillment of the prophecy. Yet if they had done their homework, they would know, for example, the hadith in the Sunan of Abi Dawood, which we'll be quoting soon, that the conquest of Constantinople is located between a number of events. Before the conquest of Constantinople, there is the Malhama. The Great War, which will make the First and Second World War look like a fight over peanuts. Has the Malhama taken place as yet? Huh? And yet you are telling me that the conquest of Constantinople 600 years ago fulfilled the prophecy? Where has your reason gone? Where has your sense gone? Secondly, that the conquest of Constantinople will be followed by the Khuruj of Dajjal. I mean, 600 years now, has Dajjal emerged? 
Is the Quruj taken place? 600 years later. And so, we, <coughs> we are going to now move towards dismissing the belief held so fervently, particularly in Turkey. And Turkish television and radio, newspapers are doing the best that they can do to brainwash the Turkish people into believing that Sultan Muhammad Fatih is the one referred to in the hadith of Muhammad I hope and I pray that we can get Turkish students to do Turkish subtitles for this lecture so it can reach the Turkish people now. We have some more difficult questions to answer. If the conquest of Constantinople is to come, how can Muslims conquer a city they've already conquered? Did you hear that question? It's, it's a bit difficult. How can Muslims conquer a city they've already conquered 600 years ago, 500 years ago? What does it mean? Well then, we have to ask our question. If Muslims are to conquer Constantinople in the future, and it is a Muslim city, meaning basically Muslim population, I wonder who is ruling over Constantinople? Who has supreme authority, strategic, military, in Constantinople? Is it Muslims? Good question to ask. <coughs> what are the political and military implications? I'm sure we have students here who are studying international relations, international politics. So you've got homework to do. What are the political and what are the military implications of an end-time Muslim conquest of Constantinople. This lecture calls for the recognition that if Islamic eschatology is able to answer these questions and no one else, not Christian eschatology, not Jewish eschatology, not political science departments of universities, only Islamic eschatology can explain this subject and answer these questions, then it is a, it is a dramatic demonstration of the supreme importance the supreme importance of Islamic eschatology in today's world of knowledge. In, in making this spectacular demonstration, Islamic eschatology will also expose the fraud of Zionist-sponsored so-called jihad in Libya and in Syria. Now let us turn. To another part of the subject. Islamic eschatology in explaining this subject now opens the possibility for the world to recognize and maybe for the Russian leadership also to recognize <coughs> that Russia, or rather Christian Russia, not atheist Russia, Christian Russia has a significant role to play in Akhirul Zaman when we turn to the military implications of the conquest of Constantinople, which is coming. Now then, the hadith. 
we're going to present four. Three of them are from the Sunan of Abu Dawood and one is Sahih Muslim. The first one, which is the most well known of all, Lataftahanna al Constantinia, Wala ni'mal amiru amiruho, Wala ni'mal jayshu the likal jaysh. You will most certainly conquer Constantinople. Who is you? <laughs> you meaning Muslims. You and Muslims who have the Qibla in Mecca, not Washington. <laughs> huh? Muslims who are faithful to the Quran and Sunnah. Not Muslims who violate the Quran and Sunnah, violate Allah's command in the Quran and establish alliances with the Zionists to overthrow the Libyan regime and establish alliances with the Zionists to attempt to overthrow and bring regime change in Syria. Not them. You, meaning you who are faithful to the Quran and Sunnah. Before this lecture ends, we have to demonstrate that those fellows have violated the Quran. And so, Constantinople is going to be liberated by Muslims, but it will also, it, also be liberated on the basis of an armed struggle. An armed struggle means using weapons, isn't it? An armed struggle means fighting, isn't it? And that's why Nabi Muhammad has praised the army. She's praised the army. And the commander-in-chief of the army, the Amir, has to be a supreme strategist. A man who is capable of leading that army successfully. And so we're talking about a military conquest of Constantinople. That's plain and clear. I don't think anybody will argue with that. The reason why I have to do this is because there are other ahadis. <laughs> which do not mention Constantinople by name, which give a different picture. Hadith number two. It is also from the Sunan of Abu Dawood. And the Prophet said, Umranu Baytil Maqdis. Umran. At that time when Jerusalem is overflowing with construction, it's built up. <coughs> Jerusalem is a booming city, booming. So construction, booming state. Jerusalem is flourishing. All of this in Omran. And so Jerusalem moving to center stage. At that time, when this happens, and this is now happening, this is now happening, it wasn't happening 600 years ago, was it? You're very quiet, aren't you? Umran Ubaytul Maqdis, Kharabu Yathrib. Umran Ubaytul Maqdis, Kharabu Yathrib. At that time when Jerusalem is flourishing, booming, center stage, construction everywhere. At that time, Yathrib or Medina will be in a forlorn state of desolation. Kharab, forlorn state of desolation, meaning playing absolutely no role either in Islamic affairs or in world affairs. <laughs> A forgotten city. At that time, when Yathrib is in a state of forlorn desolation, 
خروج الملحمه at that time the great war will take place the malhama that great war has been described in several ahadith as a terrible 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 war in fact a series of wars which will culminate with the biggest war of all hmm? the birds will fall down from the sky That malhama has not as yet taken place. But when it does, it's going to make the First World War and the Second World War look like a fight over peanuts. <laughs> and then the hadith goes on to say, and this is going to be explained in greater detail in the fourth, in the, no, the fourth hadith is coming. Khurujul malhama, fathul Constantinia that it is only after you have experienced the malhama only then would the conquest of Constantinople take place and then the hadith ends that the fathul constantinia khurujud dajjal that when Constantinople is conquered that will be followed by the khuruj of Dajjal. The release of Dajjal and the khuruj of Dajjal are two different things. I explained it last week in a lecture entitled Dajjal and Symbolism, which is on YouTube. So you might want to go there for the explanation. Dajjal was released in the lifetime of the Prophet you cannot explain the world today without the Dajjal. You cannot explain the modern feminist revolution without the Dajjal. You cannot explain women dressed and yet naked without the Dajjal. You cannot explain women dressed like men without the Dajjal. You cannot explain riba taking control of the world economy without the Dajjal. You cannot explain paper money, bogus, fraudulent, haram paper money taking control of the monetary system around the world without the Dajjal. You cannot explain the liberation for the Jews of the Holy Land, 1917. The return of the Jews to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own, 1917 to 1948. The restoration of a state of Israel in the Holy Land in 1948. And that whole, that Israel constantly growing and growing and growing in power until today it is poised to replace the United States of America as the next ruling state in the world. You cannot explain all of these things without the Dajjal. You cannot explain that the US dollar is going to collapse soon and bring down the whole world of paper money. You can't explain these things without the Dajjal. Dajjal was released in the lifetime of the Prophet But you cannot see him because he's not in our world of space and time. But when he is in our world of space and time, he emerges as a human being, a Jew, J-E-W, Jew. A young man, powerfully built, curly hair, meaning the curls at the side. And he will declare, I am the Messiah. This is the Khuruj. Similarly with Gog and Magog. I wrote my book on Gog and Magog, I don't know, four or five years ago. But Islamic scholarship seems to have a problem. No, no, no. Gog and Magog will only be released at that time. No, you're making a mistake. You cannot explain the universal facade, universal facade in every sphere of life today without Gog and Magog. The release of Gog and Magog took place in the lifetime of the Prophet But the Khuruj of Gog and Magog would come at that time when Nabi Isa Islam has killed Dajjal and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends Gog and Magog.
in the hadith of Sahih Muslim. <coughs> and so, it is clear, plain from this hadith, that the conquest of Constantinople 600 years ago, or 500 years, more than 500 years ago, had absolutely nothing, nothing, nothing whatsoever to do with the fulfillment of the prophecy of Prophet Muhammad We come to a third hadith now. At least one scholar has declared that it is daif, but he's only one. <laughs> There are many, many, many others who do not share his opinion. <coughs> but the Prophet والسلام, said, Sunan Abu, Abu Dawood again, he said that the great war, the Malhama, the conquest of Constantinople, and the Khuruj of Dajjal will all take place within a period of seven months. 500 years ago <laughs> this is seven months if if that was the conquest of Constantinople in 1453 then seven months after it occurred the Jal should have been the Khuruj should have taken place has the Khuruj of the Jal taken place is he somewhere in um, in Turkey <laughs> no this is lazy scholarship. If you had done your homework, you would have known 40, uh, you would have known 550 years ago that this is not the conquest of Constantinople, which was prophesied by the Prophet ﷺ. So the Great War or the Malhama, the conquest of Constantinople and the Khuruj of Dajjal will take place within a period of seven months. Now we come to the fourth hadith, which is a long one. <coughs> and this one is Sahih Muslim. It's not easy. It's difficult. It is narrated by Abu Huraira, who says that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam said that the sa'a or the hour will not arise until room has landed, come down in Al-A'mak wa Ad-Dabik, two places. And then an army from Medina will come out to them and it will be from the best people of the earth in that age. And when they line up against each other, Rome will say to the Muslims, do not stand between us and those of you who have captured some of our women in war. So the army of Rome will comprise women as well. We want to fight against them. The Muslims will say, no, by Allah we will not give you free access to our brothers. Then they will fight them and one third of the Muslim army will free and Allah will never accept their tawbah. And one third will be killed. <coughs> and they they will be the best shuhada in the sight of Allah. And the remaining one third will be victorious. And they will conquer Rome. And they will never again be subjected to any kind of fitna. And then they will conquer Constantinople. So this is the malhama which comes before the conquest of Constantinople. And while they're dividing the booties of war, having hung their swords on olive trees, Shaitan will scream to them, Al-Masih al-Dajjal has taken over your place. That is Al-Masih al-Dajjal, but Shaitan will say Al-Masih has taken over your place in your families you left behind. And so they will leave, although the news is false. But when they reach Syria, Dajjal does come out. 
then while they are preparing for battle, lining up in rows, salat is called, and then Nabi Isa alayhi salam comes down and leads the prayer. When the enemy of Allah sees him, that is Dajjal, he starts dissolving like salt dissolves in water. And if you leave him, he'll continue to dissolve until he dies. But Allah kills him through Nabi Isa alayhi salam, who then shows the blood on his spear. His spear. This is Sahih Muslim. And so now we have four ahadiths. And we have a difficult problem now with room. The fourth hadith from Sahih Muslim tells us something more. That before Constantinople can be conquered, a Muslim army emerging from the south, Medina is south would have to first defeat Rum in order to be able to go on to conquer Constantinople. And that the army of Rum would be an army in which women also serve. We're getting interesting now. Who is Rome? <coughs> when we go to the Quran, we get one answer very clear. Rome is the Byzantine, Eastern Christian Empire, <coughs> which used to have its headquarters in Constantinople. And after Constantinople, was conquered by the Ottomans. The capital of Rome went to Russia, Moscow. But in the same way that in the Quran, when you turn to the subject of riba, the Quran gives you one form of riba. And that is a Loan on interest. That's in the Quran, Surah Al Baqarah. But when you leave the Quran and you go to the Hadith, the subject expands. <laughs> and you find another form of riba in the Hadith mentioned by name. And that is a transaction based on deception, which yields again a profit and advantage to which one is not justly entitled. That's the elegant way for describing what the Americans call a ripoff. So, in the same way, when the Quran describes and identifies room with Eastern Christianity, that does not mean that it has exhausted the subject. And when you go to the Hadith, it is possible that the subject can expand. When we go to history, we find that Rum began as a pagan Rum, which worshipped the Greek gods, goddesses. <coughs> the pagan Roman Empire which had its capital in the Italian city of Rome. That is the beginning of Rome. And that Rome eventually was taken by the Emperor Constantine, who became a Christian, to the Bosphorus, where he established the city of Constantinople and that became Rome. At the time when the Quran was revealed, Rome was in Constantinople. But prior to the revelation of the Quran, Rome was in Italy. 
And after the conquest of Constantinople in 1453, Rome moved to Moscow. So there are two rooms. One is Christianity of the East, and the other is pagan Rome, which eventually became Christianity of the West, the Roman Catholic Church, the Protestant Church. Hmm? Which of these two fit the bill? This is Rome standing between the army from Medina and Constantinople. You have studied geography, haven't you? <laughs> uh -huh. And it is only after defeating this Rome that you can reach Constantinople. And this is a Rome which has women serving in the armed forces. I um, would like to suggest to you that Moscow is not going to stand between Medina and Constantinople. A Russian army is not going to stand between Medina and Constantinople to protect Constantinople. Because Moscow has never had any alliance. The Russians have never had any alliance with Constantinople to protect it. Well then who are those who have an alliance with Constantinople? And will stand in the way to protect Constantinople? Answer, it is the Western Christian Rome. And so it is the Zionist <coughs> NATO Rome that we'll have to fight and defeat in order to get to Constantinople. Has this war taken place as yet? Huh? If it is not taken place as yet, well then how come you're still saying that the conquest of Constantinople in 1453, 500 and something years ago, by Sultan Muhammad Fatih, has fulfilled the prophecy of Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam? I think we are making a convincing case tonight that that event has nothing to do with the fulfillment of the prophecy. And after the conquest of Constantinople, remember the next event is the Khuruj of Dajjal. And the Khuruj of Dajjal will be simultaneous with the Khuruj of Imam al-Mahdi and the return of Nabi Isa alayhi salam. Has he returned as yet? Did any one of you see him? Has the Imam al-Mahdi come as yet? I know we have a claimant in Turkey, wrote a lot of books. <laughs> no. And so let us put to rest now. Let us put it to rest and please send the message to the Turkish Muslim people that they may be educated on the subject that the prophecy of Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam concerning the conquest of Constantinople in Akhirul Zaman has not as yet taken place. The Turkish government will now have a problem. How can Muslims conquer a city that they have already conquered? Because the Ottomans were Muslims. Huh? And Con Constantinople, up to this day, is a majority Muslim city. Indeed, after Mustafa Kemal took over, under the Ottomans, they showed more tolerance. And very large Greek Christian community lived in Constantinople. And Armenians and other groups. But after the secular Turkish Republic was established, Many of them had to leave. Many of them had to leave. And so the city of Constantinople today is almost all Muslim. How can Muslims conquer a city which is already Muslim? The answer is <coughs> not who are those who live in the city, but who are those who control power in the city. 
Turkey is a member and comfortably so of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO. And NATO is the military arm of the Zionists. NATO wages wars on behalf of the Zionist state of Israel. Are we allowed to make an alliance with NATO? For this we have to go to Surah Al-Ma'idah. I'm sorry you may have heard me on this several times in the past. Please be patient and hear me one more time. Don't take a verse of the Quran in isolation. Don't take a part of an ayah in isolation. No, nope. go to the totality. Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse number 51, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Do not, O you who have faith in Allah, do not take the Jews and do not take the Christians as your friends and allies. لا تتخذوا اليهود والنصارى أولياء and we ask the question pertinently is Allah speaking about all Jews and all Christians or is he speaking about some Jews and some Christians when you go to the totality of the Quran the answer becomes very clear that he could not possibly be speaking about all Jews and all Christians no many verses of the Quran Well then, if he was not speaking about all Jews and Christians, which Jews and which Christians is he speaking about? When he says, do not take the Jews and do not take the Christians as your friends and allies, your awliya. The answer is there in the words which follow. It is because of bad methodology that we never saw the answer proper methodology and you would have seen the answer the words which follow are meaning do not take such Jews and such Christians as your friends and allies Ba'aduhum awliya ubad who themselves are friends and allies of each other. The Quran is anticipating a time to come when a Jewish Christian friendship and alliance will take place. Jews and Christians are going to become friends and allies of each other. Whosoever turns to them with friendship and alliance, as they did in Libya, to overthrow Gaddafi, as they're doing in Syria. Not all, not all in Syria, no. I'm talking about the terrorists, the mercenaries who are waging a Zionist jihad. If you turn to them with friendship and alliance, the Zionist Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the Zionist state of Qatar, the pro-Zionist government of Turkey, if you turn to them for friendship and alliance, فَإِنَّهُ مِنْ whom you now belong to them, you've lost your Islam. And therefore, a Turkish membership in NATO is haram based on the Quran and therefore Constantinople is not under Muslim control Constantinople is under the control of NATO and therefore under the control of the Zionists and that is how we can understand that the Muslim army would have to liberate it. The Turkish government could do what they want.
They can't stop it. Nabi Muhammad والسلام, is more powerful than the Turkish Prime Minister. How will this take place? An army coming from outside, from Medina, defeats Rome and then goes on to liberate Constantinople. And this room has to be a room that is in alliance with Constantinople, protecting Constantinople, which is the Western Alliance, not the Russian Alliance. <coughs> not all Turkish people have betrayed Islam. No. And so when the army is on its way to liberate Constantinople. You can look forward to civil war in Turkey, where Turkish Muslims will rise up to fight against those who are serving the cause of the enemies of Islam and to liberate the city of Constantinople from the control of NATO. What are uh, this kind of political and military analysis? I'm only touching on it because I'm not a military analyst. <laughs> there are others who are going to have to take up this, who have more knowledge of politics and of military and strategic affairs than I have. But I'm certainly opening up the subject for you. What are the political implications? of the conquest of Constantinople. When Sultan Muhammad Fatih conquered Constantinople, the first thing that he did when he entered the city was to take the greatest cathedral ever built in Christendom, Hagia Sophia which is the heart of Byzantine Christianity. It was in existence for more than 1,000 years as the premier cathedral in the Christian world. And Sultan Muhammad Fatih, in an act which I have regretfully to describe as shameful, and monstrously sinful and stupid. I, I regret having to use this language, but somebody has to do it. Somebody has to do it. He brought shame and disgrace on the world of Islam when he took that Christian cathedral, a functioning cathedral, not an abandoned building and transformed it into a masjid. You may differ with me, but one day we'll meet. One day we'll meet he who knows all things and explains all things. No, it is not permissible for us to do such a thing. No. Particularly when Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam had said that in Akhir Zaman we are going to make an alliance with room. Which room? It can't be the room that we're going to be fighting to get to Constantinople. It can't be the room which has women serving in the armed forces. <laughs> the only other room is the one in Moscow, the Eastern Christian. You are going to make an alliance with room. And this is Rome's greatest cathedral. If you had any sense in your head, you would never have done such a stupid thing. Monstrously wicked. This is their cathedral, not ours. And so on that day when our Muslim army conquers Constantinople, the first thing I hope that Al Amir will do, because the Prophet said, is to return that cathedral to the Christian. 
and extend an apology on behalf of the Ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. I hope these words of mine will reach to Moscow. <coughs> who are the people who are going to be able to fight in that army? Who are those who are going to be waging the jihad? Coming out of Medina, yes, but everybody else are going to join. Will it be the so-called Mujahideen who made an alliance with the Zionists to overthrow Gaddafi in Libya? Will it be the so-called Mujahideen who are now in alliance with the Zionists and with uh, Saudi Arabia and Qatar and Turkey to overthrow the regime in Syria? I am not a supporter of the Syrian regime, so don't make that mistake. I'm talking about being in alliance with these people. And you're going to be in this army? No, not possible. Because we no longer consider, consider you to be a part of us. You now belong to them. You do not belong to us. So this army is not going to comprise of people who are allies of the Zionist West. Now before we end, we want to turn to the military implications. And this is where I have to admit <laughs> that I am still inadequate to deal with the subject comprehensively. But we need the we need the, the screen now. I want to suggest that the Malhama is going to witness nuclear war. And that that nuclear war is going to destroy all capacity for electronic war. I'm only suggesting it because I don't have that sophisticated expertise <laughs> in nuclear physics and in nuclear warfare to be able to prove this statement. But that nuclear warfare in the Malhama is going to have a destructive impact on all electronic appliances. And so aircraft which are dependent upon electronics, aircraft won't be able to function again after the Malhama. And so aerial warfare will now be largely eliminated. What remains of the two combatants, the Russian-led alliance and the Anglo-American-led alliance, what remains of them after the Malhama? If war is to continue, it'll have to be on the land and the sea. And if it is to continue on the land and the sea, then what is the importance of Constantinople? If you look <coughs> to the north of Constantinople, you see the Black Sea, and south of Constantinople is the Mediterranean Sea. And if the Russian Navy is to be engaged in any war against Israel. The Russian Navy will have to pass through the Black Sea and then through the Bosphorus to get to the Mediterranean Sea. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has knowledge of all things and all that is to come so he knows all of akhir zaman Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created this waterway between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean Sea a strip of water called the Bosphorus and whoever controls Constantinople controls the Bosphorus and whoever controls Constantinople and controls the Bosphorus have their hands around the neck of the Russian Navy and this is why the Anglo-American Zionist Alliance always wanted to have a friendly regime in Constantinople and the Ottomans were precisely that friendly regime they never fought against Britain and France they always fought against Rome of the Eastern kind not the Western kind that was the Ottoman rule and then <coughs> when the first world war took place and now the time has come for the destruction of the ottoman empire they don't need it anymore it has served its purpose the ottomans made an alliance with germany instead of against instead of with britain and france with germany strangely because they were always friends and allies of Britain and France but this time Germany and Britain and France made an alliance with Russia the first world war 1914 and in that war Britain and France made a secret agreement with Russia that if we win this war and we conquer Constantinople then Constantinople will go to Russia Russia was very pleased to get back the capital city of Byzantium by 1917 it was clear that they were winning the war and that Russian troops were moving towards Constantinople the Jews then launched their Bolshevik revolution timing it to perfection it was a Jewish revolution to destroy and to kill the Russian monarchy the Tsar take over the government and when the Bolsheviks took over the Russian government the first thing that they did was to withdraw Russia from the war why because they do not want Russia to get Constantinople that's it so they forced Russia to withdraw from the war because they're in charge now they then went on to do something else they published all the secret agreements between Britain and France on the one hand and Russia on the other hand that in the event of a victory Constantinople will go to Russia and then having withdrawn Russia from the first world war Mustafa Kemal then got the chance <laughs> to take over Constantinople and to hand it to NATO eventually because this Bosphorus is a strategic military passageway of strategic naval importance if Russian Navy is to be kept in the Black Sea and not allowed into the Mediterranean Sea so you must always have a regime in Constantinople hostile to Russia when the conquest of Constantinople takes place 
after defeating Rome, which is Rome of the West, the implication is that since the Prophet Wasallam, you're going to make an alliance with Rome, meaning Rome of the East. But the Russian Navy, because now aerial warfare no more, the Russian Navy will now have free passage through the Bosphorus. If you look on the map, please show the Bosphorus big so they'll see the small strip of water. That small strip of water between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. So that the Russian Navy could enter into the Mediterranean Sea and that will turn the balance of power, naval power in the Mediterranean and make it a more equal and even-handed fight which eventually will lead to the destruction of the Zionist state of Israel. What I've done tonight is to just simply begin the analysis of a subject which is long neglected. I think perhaps this lecture qualifies as the first serious scholarly attempt to deal with the conquest of Constantinople in Akhiru Zaman. And the homework that you now have is to take the foundations which I have built and try to do what is beyond my reach at this time in a simple lecture, namely to, more, to have a more comprehensive understanding of the subject. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may bless all those who now devote their attention to the study of ilmu akhiru zaman and in particular to the prophecy of Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam concerning the conquest of Constantinople in Akhirul. Oh, one more thing. I forgot. When we conquer Constantinople, we're going to return Hagia Sophia to the Christians. We're going to offer an apology. And we're going to restore the name of the city to the name used by Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. So goodbye, Mustafa Kamal. ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا يا مولانا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم The question is that I have in a previous lecture which I did not do in this lecture I have analyzed the Ottoman uh, victory in conquering Constantinople and I've shown that there are many 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 questions many questions to be answered about that victory in 1453 I was not at all impressed by it um, what is the significance of this historical event in this current conflict in Syria Turkey and the nature of the alliance between Muslims and Rome as prophesied by the Prophet and the answer is that the Turkish government is doing what they did in Libya meaning they are faithful and loyal allies of NATO and faithful and loyal allies of the Anglo-American Zionist Alliance they serve them in Libya and they're serving them in Syria and Turkish Muslims are not stupid no Turkish Muslims are beginning to understand the monstrous betrayal of the Turkish ruling party and ruling government in the same way that large numbers of Saudi Muslims of Saudi Arabia are already awake we don't have to wake them up they know about the kind of traitors who rule over them yes when will the Malhama take place Umran Ubayt al-Maqdis is already with us. Jerusalem is already in a flourishing state. It's booming, it's construction all over. Kharabu Yathrib of Medina is already taking place. Medina is already in a state of forlorn desolation. And so the Malhama is the next thing to come. My 
opinion and when I give an opinion do not accept it how many times do I have to say that <laughs> when I give an opinion do not accept it unless and until you are convinced that it is correct otherwise I'm going to have dangerous students oh yes gramophone records <laughs> if the teacher makes a mistake the student will never be able to correct him because he absorbs knowledge uncritically now my teacher didn't train me that way it is my opinion that Israel is about to come out from behind the curtain and launch big wars I believe that those wars are going to take place within the next few months maybe this month next month very likely in order to influence the next United States elections but when the wars begin they will begin in such a way as to cause a chain reaction one war after another after another after another and these wars are going to continue for some years perhaps until they culminate with the Great War which will be nuclear weapons Russia is led by a very 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 intelligent and astute leader I am I have to pay tribute to Vladimir, Vladimir Putin tonight because I was expecting a Turkish invasion of Syria by now oh yes using the aircraft that was down as an excuse because NATO is frustrated they've done everything they could and they've not been able to bring down the regime in Turkey I mean in Syria so the next was to invade <laughs> but what Putin did in Geneva was a masterly stroke a master stroke of diplomacy I am my student I am myself a student of international relations and I was a diplomat for five years of my life so I know something about diplomacy and what he achieved in Geneva was a master stroke of diplomacy he has given Syria a breathing space hopefully that the bloodletting will now decrease United States had to come to agreement with Putin yes that is the brilliance of his diplomacy that he got the United States to agree with him and so the first message I have for the Syrian people all those who want to stop this bloodletting and all these terrorist acts is you have to be grateful to Russia which has saved you at least for the time being from a Turkish military invasion of the country the Russian government knows that the Syrian regime cannot survive it doesn't have religious legitimacy it doesn't have moral legitimacy no it has been a an oppressive regime oh yes and so you will have to have a transition to something else the Russians know that the answer to the problem now is for the Syrian Muslims to recognize that Putin has given to them an opportunity and I don't want to speak too much I have to be guarded in my language and that is that you must understand who are your enemy after this lecture you will understand that Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam has prophesied an alliance with Rome not Rome of the West Rome of the East and so you have to make a distinction a division now all those in Syria 
who remain opposed to Zionism and the Zionist state of Israel and the Anglo-American Zionist Alliance and NATO <laughs> and all those who are in opposition to NATO whether you are pro-Assad or anti-Assad it doesn't matter you must all now come together in a constitutional conference and work out, work out an agreement for you to come together as one body to oppose these who have come in with Saudi money and Saudi arms and Qatari money and Qatari arms and Turkish money and Turkish arms to fight on NATO's behalf and to fight on behalf of the state of Israel to bring about a regime change in Syria as you did in Libya. This coming together of all the forces in Syria that are anti-NATO can't take place in Syria. No. They'll send every terrorist in the world to bomb the daylights out of you. So Putin has to offer an invitation, even if it's a thousand, two thousand, three thousand people, representative of all groups in Syria that are anti-Zionist. All. Whether you're pro-Assad or anti-Assad, doesn't matter. And you must all go to Moscow. And in Moscow, you have to work out this alliance, not elections. When you work out this alliance, <coughs> you will bring about a regime change in Syria, which would then be in alliance with Moscow and will allow the Russian naval base in Syria to remain. If this is to take place, it is the ulama of Islam who have to take the lead. And with tears in my heart and tears in my eyes, I have to ask again and again, where are the scholars of Islam? So this malhama will take place in stages, at the end of which you'll have the nuclear warfare that will be the biggest war of all. Any more questions? Yes. What's the significance of the water level in the Sea of Galilee? It's going down. It's going down. The water level in the Sea of Galilee is a measuring rod by which we can determine how soon how much time is left for the return of Nabi Isa Islam? Because the hadith in Sahih Muslim is that the first of Gog and Magog will pass by the Sea of Galilee and start to drink the water and by the time the last of them pass they'll say there used to be water here. We dried up. Or well, the question is, is it permissible for Muslims to form an alliance with non-Muslims? Is it permissible? Or are we allowed to have an alliance only with Muslims? We have to distinguish between the word hudna, which is a truce, a temporary cessation of fighting. That's Treaty of Hudaybiyah. Hudaybiyah was not a peace treaty. A peace treaty is sulh. Hudaybiyah was not sulh. Hudaybiyah was hudna. Hudna. A truce for 10 years. You don't make a peace treaty for 10 years. Allah has not prohibited us from maintaining friendly ties. Surah al mumtahana at the end of Surah al mumtahana He has not prohibited us from maintaining friendly ties and maintaining alliances with those who are not hostile to us, who do not wage war on us, who do not drive us out of our homes, who are not aggressors. No. But when you make an alliance with a people, the first ayah of Suratul Ma'idah, when you give your word, 
you must keep your wife. <coughs> In Surah Al-Ma'idah, he has prohibited an alliance with only those Christians and those Jews who are themselves allies of each other. He has not prohibited an alliance with other Jews and other Christians. What are the characteristics and attributes of the Muslim soldiers who participate in the Malhama? Nabi Muhammad wasalam, said, the hadith is that they will be the best people in the earth of all the people of the earth at that time. And so the best people would be such that one third of them will turn their backs and run away. Huh? One third of the army is going to comprise people who when they face the enemy will turn their backs and run away. Hmm? And Allah will never accept the Tawbah. So we don't know what kind of uh, army it's going to be, but this is instructive. Hmm? This is instructive. What we do know is that this cannot be an army which should include those who form alliances with the enemy, as they did in Libya and as they're now doing in Syria. If we have no more... Yeah. I said that the Malhama is going to be between the two supreme military forces in the world, the Russian-led alliance and the American-led alliance. But the, the people who are at the heart of that alliance, they're not going to be de destroyed by the nuclear war. They build their underground cities already. <laughs> As soon as the war begins, they are underground to survive. They know what's coming. It is those who are on the surface and who don't have any underground city to go to. These are the ones who are going to perish. But a Muslim, if he is a Muslim, he has unshakable conviction in his heart that if Allah has written death for him, nothing can prevent it. And if Allah has not written death for him, no one can cause it. The day that is shaken in your heart, goodbye. Goodbye. And so, it doesn't matter to us if we have to die. No. Because we accept we cannot die unless Allah has ordained it. Hmm? Yes, I believe that the Zionists want that malhama because they want to get a substantial reduction in the population of the world. Israel can't rule the world as presently constituted. No. But if there is a substantial reduction in the population of the world, then that remnant which survives nuclear warfare would be easier for the Zionists to be able to handle. So yes, I believe that most people now living on the earth are not going to survive the Malhama. Any more questions? Between Al-Malhama and? Dukhan. Yes. I give my opinion, and of course I can be wrong when I give an opinion, that the Dukhan is the mushroom cloud from thousands of nuclear weapons. Yeah. So the Dukhan would take place simultaneously with the Malhama. Any more questions? رَبَّنَا تَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّمِيرَ عَلِيمُ وَتُبَ عَلَيْنَا يَا مُولَانَا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ التَّوَابِ رَحِيمُ one announcement, and that is that on 14th of July, Saturday, I'm going to conduct 
a half day seminar on an introduction to Islamic eschatology demonstrating how Islamic eschatology explains today's political and economic and monetary reality. The seminar is organized by Malaysian Airlines. You have to go to my website to get the location. It's from 9 in the morning until Zuhar. There's no fee for entrance, but because they're preparing some food, I think, they need to know how many people are coming. So you're going to have to contact them and let them know how many of you are coming. Okay? 14th of July, from 9 in the morning, Malaysian Airlines. Go to my website to get the location. Yeah. Huh? It's on the screen. It's on the screen. Okay. And uh, these books are outside. You can get them. And if you... Female entrance. The female entrance. Uh, the Medina returns to center stage in Akhiru Zaman and Jerusalem in the Quran. Outside. <laughs> Ampunan kepadaku, ampunkanlah dosaku Sesungguhnya engkau lah pengampun dosa-dosa besar Tuhanku, aku tidak layak untuk syurgamu Tetapi aku tidak pula sanggup Sanera kamu dari itu kurniakanlah ampunan kepadaku ampunkanlah dosaku sesungguhnya engkau lah pengampun dosa dosa besar ilah Allah fahabli 